If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. It's really exciting to see a company like Viore just exploding the way that they have been. They're crushing. Well, I really I'm I really like Joe. I mean, a lot. I think he's a, I think he's a really good guy. I think he's got a great mission. I think he puts out an incredible product. I mean, I'm looking around the room right now, and Doug's got his zip up hoodie and pants on. Justin's got a pullover hoodie on. You've got your jacket zip up. I'm wearing the pants and a shirt. Like their their gear is they've infiltrated us. No, no, they have. They're it's legit. It's legit awesome, and it's really cool to see uh, them build a brand. It's also awesome that. You know, Taylor found them really early on. I love finding a brand before everybody else mm-hmm. finds a brand and being one of the first people to yeah, kind of inter- coolest. Right, introduce it to a lot of people. So it's it's awesome to see them. And in in Joe had a great story. He told us some pretty interesting stuff about how he got where he's at now. There's a story about a psychic in there, isn't this there? Was a, <laughs> this oh, was a really yeah, cool. I know. This was, was a great. great this was a great interview. Great. You know, like like anything else that I've realized with us and when we get to know a lot of our like, you know, we've now built a, a relationship with him. We've known him for almost 2 years. We've met several times. We've gone down and had we're going to have our second event with them. He's been up here now twice like so we're on a different level, I think, relationship-wise, and so you can feel that I think come out in the episode. Yeah, it came like, out in the conversation, and you could you could just tell the way that he describes his business and his practices, his core values align so well with ours, and that's why we mesh so well. Yeah, and our our first live event that we ever did, where we're doing like a Q and A with our audience, um, was at the Viore, one of their stores down in Encinitas, and that was I don't know, like two years ago. What a great experience. We met our fans. That's when we hung out with Joe and some of his team. And since then, they've grown exponentially, far bigger. But we're again, they invited us down to do another live Q&A event on the 10th of May. So we're going down there again, going to meet our audience and fans live again. Um, and if you want to attend to it, it's on the 10th of May. It's at 6 p.m., you just go and sign up at mindpumplive.com. Get yourself a ticket. And they also, what's cool is, I, I know they did this last year. I'm sure they'll do it again this year where they hook up the people that come there with a, a one-day type of deal for them being there, a deal for them when they're shopping in the yep. store, and everybody went bananas last year. It's awesome. Now, uh, Viore uh, just launched their spring-summer collection. There's a lot of new styles. Um, so if you go to Viore Clothing, V-U-O-R-I clothing.com forward slash mindpump, There'll be a code on that page, a mind pump code that'll give you twenty five percent off your whole order. You so make sure you go to that link though, because on that link deal. they'll have the the actual code. Yeah, you, you have to go to vioriclothing dot com forward slash mind pump to get the code right. for the twenty five percent. Also, this month, Maps Split. This is our advanced bodybuilder type program. That program is half off, so fifty percent off. Go to mapsplit dot com. Um, and use the code SPLIT50, S-P-L-I-T-5-0, for the discount. Now, if you're not advanced, you're not into the bodybuilding training, you want to look at other types of fitness programs because your goals are different, you have a different exercise history, go to mapsfitnessproducts.com and check out all those other uh, MAPS programs. All right, guys, so uh, I also listen to podcasts, and one of my favorite podcasts besides Mind Pump is the Jordan Harbinger Show one of the top, I believe they won number one or top podcast of the year last year. And Jordan, he's been on our show. He's one of our favorite people. Great, great interview. And in fact, I learned from listening to him all the time. And a recent episode he did was with Todd Herman. The title of the episode was The Alter Ego Effect. Um, and there was some interesting information there, like how you can kind of turn yourself into someone else through using different cues to perform at higher levels. Actually, I have Jordan here with me right now. Jordan, that episode was pretty crazy. It's really good, especially for athletes and things like that, because Todd, what he does, he's a good friend of mine. In fact, you guys should have him on at some point. He's super fascinating. What he's done is he trains, this is just an example. He had a tennis player, and she kept choking at the end of the game, like, or she would let somebody close a huge lead that she had. And he's like, all right, what's going on here? And he's digging down and finds out that she was gro- she was raised to be treating everyone fairly. And she thought there was a thing going on in her head where if she was just dominating someone on the court, she'd go, oh, I'm embarrassing them. This isn't nice. I need to be nice. And then she would sort of ease up. And it's all subconscious, right? She had to dig for all this stuff. And so he created an alter ego for her that was like a crazy 
aggressive bitch. <laughs> and this alter ego that he creates for his clients, this alter ego in particular for this tennis player, happens when she puts on like her gloves or whatever that she uses for the racket or something like that. And so when those go on, she has a different name. She's super aggressive, relentless, and then she takes them off and she can go back to these positive personality traits that don't jive with being an aggressive athlete. And so he helps solve those problems. And so this alter ego effect, which is what he talks about in the episode, has it can play when you're an entertainer, you're a comedian. You know, as we, we all had Lisa Lampanelli on before. Mm -hmm. She's the first one to say, look, it's an act. Like you don't go up to your friends and start cussing them out because it's funny. They didn't sign up for that there's certain arenas where you got to do it, but you got to put on an alter ego. And that's what Todd Herman discussed in this episode. It was fascinating. And I've started using some of his techniques uh, when I speak in public and when I do interviews and I've already noticed an improvement in performance. Anyway, you got to listen to that episode, the Jordan Harbinger show. Uh, we will link it in our show notes. So without any further ado, here we are talking to Joe Kudla of Yori. We were trying to figure it out before we got started. It's been a year and a half since we had you on the show, Joe. It's been. It it's doesn't been a, feel like that, though. Yeah, I know. At all. It literally, I was on the way over here today, just trying to think about how, when I was here, and we we kind of narrowed it down to right around a year and a half. But it literally is like a blink of an eye. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Now you're one of my favorite partnerships because if it wasn't for you. Uh, Sal would be dressed like he's uh, representing Old Navy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I'm so fucking glad that we yeah, got you. I appreciate you've, it. Yeah. You've saved our image. Yeah. You know, right. you saw you getting some compliments. Keeping the youth. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, a lot of hey sexy and you know, that kind of stuff <laughs> yeah. from random people. Yeah. Mostly old women. It's an adjustment. Men. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'm no, no, for reals though. Uh, I really, I mean, this. You, your, your customers love your stuff. Like that's the, you guys must have an incredible return yeah. customer base. Yeah. Once we introduce them to it, it's like, yeah, people are just like, oh my God, thank you. Like they're so happy about what they bought. Yeah. Well, first of all, thank you guys so much for the support. You guys have been incredible partners for Viore. Um, we're really honored to be in partnership with you guys. And, um, and yeah, you know, we pride ourselves on making great product and when, um, you know, I think that's part of the reason we've been able to do what we've been doing on a bootstrap budget. We, you know, we didn't go out and raise a ton of money like a lot of our competitors. We've been able to do this off a of small. Mm -hmm. We did raise some money in the early days with friends and family, but you know, if you don't make good product in this time, day and age, like, what's the point? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. it's, mm -hmm. it's not going to work. So no, no. And you guys have, I mean, so we saw you a year and a half ago. We went down. We had that event, which was great, by the way. Yeah, great staff. We still talk about it around the Viore office. Oh, really? Well, it was just crazy to see how the the Mind Pump community show up and support and um, and just see how fired up they were to be there and be in the experience with you guys. It was really inspirational for us, too. You oh, know? That's cool. Oh, um, appreciate it. Yeah, well, our fans are, are, are crazy like we are. Um, but uh, but <laughs> yeah. you guys, since then, and this is why I think I got a little confused with how long ago we... Because it only has been a year and a half, but it feels longer, not because it necessarily feels longer, but because of where you guys are at now compared to a year and a half ago. What has happened since then? Because you guys are fucking everywhere yeah. now. Yeah. You know, we were just talking about a little bit off air, but, you know, um, I feel like in business, just a lot like what you guys are doing, you know, you you, you set an intention, you know, you have a, a, a clear vision and, you know, it's not easy at the start. You know, a lot of people think we've been doing this for 10 years. We're, we're in our fifth year now. We're starting our fifth year in market selling now. And, um, so it happened relatively fast, but it's like, you just chip away at it. It's like pushing a ball up a hill. And then all of a sudden, just one day you, you do reach that, you know, quote unquote tipping point and, um, and, and it starts getting a little bit easier and that ball starts rolling down the hill and your job as a brand manager becomes more steering it down the hill as opposed to mm -hmm. working so hard to make it happen. It's oh, now right. about, you know, putting the right guidelines on it and making mm. sure you're continuing to invest in quality and innovation and all the things that made us successful in the first place. Do you, mm -hmm. do you remember that, that moment of that tipping point? Like was there, was there a feeling around the, the office or do you remember something significantly happening where you're like, Oh shit, like we're starting to roll now. You know, it's funny cause there's not like one, one specific thing, you know, uh, Nikki Sicilio, our VP of marketing, she's pretty much my co-founder started the business with me when we were in a garage five years ago. And, you know, we talk about it all the time cause we have to kind of pinch ourselves and we're like, what was that defining moment? Um, and it's hard to say, you know, you could point to sales. Like we had a couple of days on our e-com site. We broke our e-com site. Um, we, <laughs> we launched a new season and we broke the site and we said, maybe this is, you know, this, this could be the moment. Um, 
and then, you know, we were getting some feedback from some of our larger partners, um, you know, out there in the wholesale landscape, like REI, that we were kind of best in class and we're competing against brands like Nike and Patagonia and these huge brands that are super established. So cool. And, and wow. we were, you know, ranking and outselling and outperforming some of our, our competitors that we looked up to and inspired to be. And um, so there was a lot of those kind of little things along the way, but yeah. But yeah, there, there's not like one thing that I'm like, man, this happened. Like, it wasn't like, you know, Kim Kardashian wore our <laughs> shorts and next thing you know, you know, I'm on Oprah and it, the rest is history. Right, like right, that. right. What kind of growth have you seen over the last uh, couple of years or last year? Are you able to talk about like percentage growth or anything like that? Yeah. So, um, gosh, you know, compounded, we've been growing at like over 200% a year. Holy cow. Um, wow. Since we launched the business. Every year? Um, yeah. If you were to just look at like a compound at average growth rate, um, last year, I think we closed the year right around 140% growth over the last year. So more than doubled the business. Our, our kind of ori original plan going into last year was that, you know, we would, we would kind of just shy of double the business. We ended up growing like 140%. We were really proud of that. But, um, you know, the crazy thing, you know, was that just five years ago, Nikki and I were working in a like literally a spider infested, um, garage that had no AC, no heating. It was either freezing cold or super hot. There were two of us, like it was almost embarrassing to try to hire there because we were, we couldn't, you know, in good faith, tell people they were going to work in that space. And now, you know, we just moved into a th almost 13,000 square foot office. We have a, our own fitness studio that we're curating full like fitness classes within um, our space for our team. We almost have 60 employees. Wow. Um, we've got three retail stores and growing and we're just, you know, the product line has grown like crazy. And, um, you know, we yeah. launched women's, which has been a huge milestone for us. Has yeah. that been a, a big yeah. success? It has. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We kind of went into it, you know, knowing when we launched the business, we always knew women would be a part of it because the brand was always kind of inspired by this lifestyle and community around us where we lived in Encinitas and women were a big part of that. But we really saw the opportunity to get into the market from more of a business standpoint to lead with men's, mm -hmm. um, which is a harder market. Well, I guess in some ways it would be harder market because women are the consumers. Yeah, that's right. You well, know? it was underserved, which you saw opportunity. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And it was harder, you know, when we launched, you know, I can't tell you how many, you know, when I started the business, I literally took two suitcases full of product. I went to New York city and I just walked around. I went into gyms, I went into yoga studios. I went in anybody who would talk to me and you know, I just got no's all the time because people were like, look, Lululemon's exploding. Mm -hmm. I got to address that. I got to figure out how to get my women, um, my female cu customer out of Lulu and into another female brand mm -hmm. that I can carry. Right men's was such an afterthought. Um, so it was definitely, we were early on the scene, um, to focus on men's. Yeah. Mm. And, and men are not as consumers. We're not typically, uh, nearly as loyal. So like a female consumer will typically buy a product like it, and then they'll keep buying that product and show loyalty. Men tend to not do that, but you guys seem to have a very high level of loyalty among the men that buy your clothes. Why, why do you, why do you think that is? Gosh, I, you know, honestly, I, I can't point to anything other than the fact that, you know, when we launched the business, we we set out to make clothes that we couldn't find. And a lot of entrepreneurs say that, and that sounds really cliche. I, I get mm -hmm. that. But um, but in my case, it was true. You know, we were all surfers. We were living down in Southern California. We wore board shorts to the gym. Mm -hmm. And while that's great, you know, um, we felt like there was a better product out there, you know, to align kind of that, that aesthetic and spirit of kind of Southern California and beach culture and the things that inspired us, but make it with really, really, really good quality materials, better construction, you know, construction that was actually designed for movement and sweat, mm -hmm. um, and merging those two things, those two worlds, I, I felt like hadn't really been done before. And so it might it, it might be partly that. It looks fresh. It feels a little bit different than kind of what's been going on in activewear. Yeah, I can tell mm -hmm. you my experience. I am not a, you know, like Adam jokes about it, but I'm not a, a loyal co consumer of apparel or clothing. I don't really care. But I do like things that feel good. So if something feels really good, I like it. And then I get the benefit of my girlfriend being like, whoa, that looks really good on you. I like that T-shirt. She never says that about the T-shirts I wear. So it's <laughs> like I get to wear something super comfortable. Then people say it looks good. And I know it's consistent. Like every time I get something from you guys, 
every single time it fits real well. Yeah, and I think for men, there's been two different options, right? So you have like the, they came out with like sweats, like like shorts that you could wear that were really comfortable. You could wear the gym, but then it smelled bad after I was done. (laughs) Yeah. You know, and like, and then you'd have your other shorts that you wore to work or, you know, out for leisure, whatever. But that like that combo where it's like I could I could work out but then I'm not gonna like just immediately stink I could have some time <laughs> you know that was like huge for me yeah <laughs> what, yeah no we we actually say built to move and styled for life but that's spot on you know we're trying to build transitional product because you know in today's day and age there's a lot of choices and you know it's it's nice to be able to throw on a pair of shorts go for a workout um, and then just go go about your day, you know? And that we really strive for that in everything we make. Yeah, and then there was a, a, a return policy that you guys have, something like a, a happiness. Can you explain this to me? Because this is kind of crazy to me. Yeah, it's it's actually one of our core values as a business. It's It extends beyond our... Um, our return policy, but yeah, we have a lifetime guarantee on our product. So That's crazy. Does know. anybody else do that in your space? You know... Uh, not that I can think of, you know, you, we kind of, you know, Nordstrom has been kind of had that mindset, you know, and they've, they've been known for great service. Um, but, but we, it, to us, it was important, you know, we want to stoke people out. We want people to, you know, we recognize that buying premium athletic wear is an investment and we want you to be stoked. And mm-hmm. if at any point that garment's not serving you, you, it's not working for its intended use, you know, we'll take it back or exchange it for something else. That's insane. You Absolutely know. insane. But that just shows, goes to show kind of what I'm talking about. You're, you're, the people who buy your stuff like it so much. Because as a business, I mean, from a purely business standpoint, you can't do something that's going to break the bank or that's going to bankrupt you. Otherwise, you can't continue. Yeah. But you guys have such good... Uh, your People don't return shit. People love your stuff. They come back to buy more. You know it's not going to hurt you. You know, you're going to come out with this guarantee, but you know it's not going to happen much because people yeah. just love your stuff. Yeah, yeah, sure. You know, you always get the few that are going to abuse a policy like that. But... You know, for us, it's more important to, to, to um, you know, put our money where our mouth is. You know, we claim we make great product. It's one of our core values. We want to lead with great product. You know, we invest so much time and energy in making great product. And occasionally we have issues, you know, we're, we're human, mm-hmm. you know, we're making products with big factories now. And, you know, occasionally there's issues. And when there's issues, we want to make it right, you know. Any growing pains since you, this, this fast growth, are you experiencing any growing pains or challenges? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Um, nothing catastrophic, you know, we don't have any kind of sheer leggings issues like Lulu had. Or, <laughs> no, no, no. Nice subtle jab. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you want to call them issues. <laughs> <laughs> nothing like that, but you know, definitely w- the numbers are getting big, you know? So it's like when you start a business and let's say you're doing 5 million in sales, a jump from five to 10 is still very manageable from a factory. But when you're going to make a jump from say like 40 to 80, you know, that's a big number, you know? So you got to really be in tune with things that we didn't have to think about at, in the early days. You know, in the early days, it was make a great product, market that product, sell that product, deliver great customer service. Now it's, we got to add on, Hey, can we even make that many products mm-hmm. at our factory? Right. right. You know, cause yeah. they only have so much space. Um, it's not like you just send a purchase order to a factory and they're like, yep, no problem. On the other end comes whatever you ordered. That's right. You got to work with them and understand their capacity. And, and once you maximize, maximize capacity there, you've got to plan to move it into other factories and make sure that their quality standards are up to par. So mm. in the apparel business, when you're really scaling fast, that's a huge concern and, and a place that we're, we're investing a lot of time and energy right now. So how do you combat that? Is there, do you slow down the process of creating new designs? Do you, are you outsourcing? Sourcing? Like, what do you, how do you combat that? That, Well, you know, the production process, um, there's a lot of really talented people and we've been fortunate to, to bring on a bunch of them that are very focused on this. And so they're just spending a lot of time out at the factories, talking with them, um, working with them on their capacity so that we understand on the front end of a season, like what our limitations might be. Mm, okay. Um, but you know, to, to date, you know, we're still relative, you know, when you think about the big brands out there, we're still relatively small and niche. Um, and so we're, we're not running into issues where we have to limit kind of our creativity or limit, limit our, um, kind of desire to enter new categories or anything like that. But, um, it's just something that's always top of mind when we're placing those purchase mm-hmm. orders. I was going to ask you about that in terms of the temptation of it, because you are, you know, somewhat competing with these massive brands now. And is there any pull in that direction to like do anything sports related more or, you know, kind of go against the big dogs? You know, 
we talk about that all the time. You know, the, there's a big debate around, um, you know, like athlete marketing, right? Mm -hmm. And you think about what that used to be, right? The Nikes, the Under Armors, they would tie up, tie up the best athletes. They would distribute their product at mass retail. And then, you know, Lululemon, that was a really defined great model that worked really well. And it still does. But then Lululemon came along, didn't spend a dollar on marketing. Mm -hmm. You know, they were getting product on local trainers, um, yoga teachers, you know, people just out in the community doing inspiring things that weren't paid athletes. And look, Lululemon's become one of the most successful um, activewear brands out there. Um, you know, still not quite at, at the same scale as Nike when you think globally, but, but you know, they're, they're on a tear. Yeah, and shit, yeah. Nike's had a head start. You know what I'm saying? They've been yeah. going for a very long time. Yeah. What goes into the process of creating like a piece like you're wearing? Like you came in, I love the jacket you're rocking right now. I'm, I can't wait till it releases. Yeah, I'm going to have to get that. Right. And I knew you would like that. What goes into the process of creating something like that? Well, there's two kind of methodologies on building a product. You can start with a, a design and then back your way into the sourcing, which is kind of the, what are all the materials that are going to actually make the garment special and make it work. So you first decide, okay, we're going to do this button up jacket, lightweight type of thing. Yeah. We agree on like the overall theme of it. Yeah. And then you start to reverse like, okay, what's the material going to look like? How much is going to weigh? Yeah. How strong? Is that how you do this? Yeah, that's one way of doing it. You know, for us, because of, um, the tactile nature of our product was so important, like Sal, you mentioned it. It's something we're actually very intentional about is, you know, we want to make product that's really soft and people love living in, mm -hmm. you know, you don't want to take it off because it's just so damn soft. That is really important. So, you know, one way is to, what we don't want to do is pigeonhole ourselves and design something, but then not be able to find a fabric for it. So I spend a lot of time sourcing materials. You know, I'm working with different textile mills, um, both on kind of their new collections and, and seeing what they have that might suit our needs. And that a lot of times inspires and informs a new product. So we might find a fabric and say, this would be amazing in a jacket, or this would be a great material for a new short that we've been thinking about. Mm. Um, and so that's kind of building it bottoms up, like mm. from materials up right. and getting inspired by your kind of materials and the palette that you have. Um, and then the other way is kind of more tops down, like building a, um, a jacket, designing it, and then going out and looking and trying to find something, which is great. They both can work. Um, and we, we tend to each season kind of do a little bit of both, but, um, it, it's, it's painful when you have a great design idea, but then you can't find the materials that's really going to support it. Mm. And the, and the worst thing you want to do is release something that's substandard or doesn't meet your needs because, you know, those tend to not work as well. Now, right. do, you, do you, do you outsource this? Are you part of designing it? Like, how does this, that's what I'm curious about. I mean, I made the mistake as a young kid, so I've, you know tried to launch three apparel lines at one point in my life, you know? Yeah. And one of the things that I finally came to grips with and realized is that I have no talent whatsoever in that world. Like, who am I to think that I'm going to compete with Lulu, Calvin Klein, these brands like that? I, I just, I was like every other kid who I think at one point that wants to be an entrepreneur and has this dream, oh, if I can build this network of people, I can make some t-shirts and make a cool logo. Like that, my, my thought process was all around the logo and the look of it and, yeah. and being cool. And then I could sell all these things, but not realizing how important like the design and the creation that I was going to create. Do you outsource that? Is that you? Are you partnered up with somebody? Do you have multiple people that are designing different things? What does that look like? Well, when we started the business, it was me and one other girl. Uh, her name's Rebecca Bray, and she's a very, very talented designer. And I, I owe her so much um, because she believed in this scrappy little kid that had a vision for a clothing brand. And it's kind of like going to your buddies and being like, hey, we're, I'm going to start a band. We're going to be the next Rolling Stones. Right. You know, it's right. like everybody, there's I've no barrier that. to entry. Like <laughs> anybody can pick up a guitar and start strumming some chords. Anybody can kind of get into the clothing business. There's, right. there's no barriers to entry. So, you know, I, you know, I, I'd spend a lot of time. I actually had two failed. Well, I, I hate to use the word failed, but I had two apparel concepts that didn't really go anywhere before this. And, um, so I'd spent a lot of time in it and I just loved product. I loved design. I loved, I, I always felt like there's this part of my brain that's creative that never gets expressed in what I do every day. And I was like, dude, I got to do in some point in my life, I got to jump in with two feet and do this. And Rebecca listened to what I had to say. And she was a very sought after designer. And she said, you know what? I believe in this. I think that, I think that we can do something special. And, and she joined me. 
Um, and her and I pretty much designed the first several collections just on her living room floor together, you know? And do you believe that this would have been impossible had you not had somebody like that? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm. There's no, I couldn't have done this on my own. Um, I, well, I shouldn't say that it's possible that I could have, I, I just would have had to acquire a lot of skills and knowledge that I really have, have learned along the way. Yeah. What are some of those? What are some of the things that you've probably pieced together by having someone as talented as her working with you? Well, I think part of it is just learning how the whole process works, you know, how you develop a commercial calendar and a go to market strategy. And, you know, when it comes to design specifically, it's like, okay, I'm going to start designing now. I, I need all my technical drawings. We call them tech packs, but essentially all of your illustrations of what that collection is going to look like do by this date. It needs to be handed off to these factories by X date. You need to have a first proto review by this date and you work yourselves towards like a sales samples, which aligns with the broader market. And so you can, your go to market is like in sync with what all your competitors are doing. Mm. I didn't really understand all that stuff. Mm. And, um, but you know, it's just, it just shows you that like, if you work hard and you believe in something, um, you know, it can happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we just, I just had a vision for what this thing, I could feel it, not, not with my eyes, but with my gut, you know, it was like down in the gut level, which is for me, what always resonates. It's like, if I feel it and I'm sleeping and every night I'm thinking about it and dreaming it and I can, I can see it happening. Like that's when I know I should keep moving forward. And, you know, in the early days, it was not easy. We, we had a lot of stumbling blocks and there was definitely times you can ask my wife, I'd come home and be like, I don't think this thing's going to go, you mm -hmm. know? And um, uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to us. And one of the questions that I get all the time is how do I know? Cause, cause I understand, I can completely relate to what you're talking about. It's how I felt about what we did with mind pump. Like you just feel it, you know, like you're, you're compelled uh, rather than, you know, being driven, you're compelled to do it. But how do you know when to stop or change gears? You talked about having two other ideas before that were apparel, com apparel companies that didn't work. How did you know that those weren't the ones? And how did you know that, that Viore was, even though you went through some challenges? I think a lot of it was just intuition. You know, I was younger at, those, at the time and I had never really built a successful business. Um, and I was in a little bit over my head. I didn't have that kind of, seasoned partner and, and designer that was kind of helping me. Um, I think one of the biggest differences this go around was that I jumped in with two feet. And so I, I, I pretty much cut the, cut the, cut the bow line and, and it was either going to work or I was going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and that really, it was inspiring, but, um, so you were, you had another job with those other ones. Yeah. So you weren't, yeah, that makes a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard people say that. It's a different mentality, a different mindset. Well, shit, I, I used to say it about us. When of we, course. When we first started, um, I, I remember there was a, a long time there. And I get it. I mean, everyone's married, kids, mortgages. You know, we had other careers and stuff going on and, and we're successful. And here we are starting this vision and this venture that we have. And I remember the the boys all we we're all kind of like wait we're like counting the dollars like okay mm -hmm. it's not quite enough yet it's yeah. not quite enough for us to just walk away from everything else, and I still believe that uh, you know had we done that sooner I think we would have got to where we're at even faster because it's when you commit like that and there's no look you can't turn back I, it brings something out of you I, that mm -hmm. I don't know if you can get that out of yourself by easing your way in all the time so I I can't agree more with that now. What, when you when those other ones failed, were they completely different ideas? Were they not like the the type of apparel that you're doing now, or were they similar in, in type, just designed differently? Like, what was so different about it? So the first one was a women's contemporary line, believe it or not, and uh, that sounds really weird. What would I what was I doing involved in that <laughs> business? But um, it was actually my girlfriend at the time, and we were young kids, you know, in our early twenties, and um, she had just graduated with a design degree. And I was working in this finance job, kind of unhappy. And um, she was like, I'm going to go to work for one of these big design um, houses in LA. And I just said, why not? Just You're so talented. I like saw the talent in her. I'm like, you're so talented. I'm like, let's just start our own thing. You know, and I'll, I'll back it and, um, you know, I'll help you with everything you need help with. I'll help you with the business side of things, but, but we can do this. And so we were young kids and I was working a crazy job where I, I was working like 55, 60 hours a week was kind of a normal week. And then at night we would pour ourselves some glasses of wine and we would sit there and cut fabric 
um, we would have these pattern makers make us patterns and we'd sit there and cut fabric. Then the next day on my lunch break, I'd drive it down to National City by the border and go to these factories that I developed relationships with and I'd have them sew up samples and then we'd come back home and the next night we'd do a fitting. And then, you know, on the weekends we were driving to LA and shopping, you know, different fabric suppliers. It was just like this crazy bit. Like I look back now on what I was doing and it was just absolutely crazy. It was totally not scalable. Like we, <laughs> we literally, it was destined to, to, to not go anywhere, but it was, it was just like the best experience for me. I, it gave me so much confidence and just like, okay, like I, I I'm starting to see how this all mm-hmm. works. And I was in my, you know, I think it, by the time we shut that down, I was in my mid twenties and we had a showroom come to us in LA and they were like a sales agency and they said, we like what you're doing and we'd like to represent you guys. Um, but here's what it's going to mean. And like the list of things that they outlined, I was like, we're just not ready for this. And I, that was the moment where we were like, we got to jump in with two feet. Um, or we should, we should close, we should stop doing this. And we decided to stop it. And, um, so that was like a women's contemporary line had nothing to do with what we're doing now. And then the second one, um, was, it was actually called Viore. It was, I call it Viore 1.0, but it wasn't athletic in nature. Um, it was a cut and sew t-shirt line. We were, we were doing organic cotton tees and we were telling stories of awesome people that were up to different things. And we were printing stories on the inside of the tees and we were, you know, again, going out on the weekends, selling them to specialty stores up and down the California coast. And, um, that one I really believed in. Um, and then the 2008, 2009 financial collapse happened. Oh. And, um, we just like Walmart started selling organic cotton teas for 25 bucks. And we were like, okay, we're going to, we're going to close this thing. And my partner came to me and was like, look, I'm going to go live in an Airstream and go travel around the United States for a year. <laughs> and, um, and I told him at the time I said, Chad, you know, um, look, I said, I I know that it doesn't seem like it right now. I go, but I think you're making a huge mistake. I go, Viore is going to be a huge company one day. And I was like, I don't think you should make this decision. He's like, Hey, I'll sell you the the trademark for a dollar. Um, and, and I'm, I'm out. Shut up. Wow. Shut up. Really? Do you still ever talk to you? I go, Chad. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Uh, yeah. We see each other occasionally, you know, he lives in, uh, the same area that I do. And so we run into each other and there's no, like no hard feelings. Um, right. Of course not. He left. Yeah. He left. And you know, we shelved after he left, I just literally shelved it. And it wasn't for like three or four years that we decided to relaunch the business with a totally different mission. Mm. Um, Okay, so what happened in that? Okay, you you shut it down. You realize that he takes off in his airstream. What's going on in that three year gap before you decide you're going to reopen this thing? So I had um, another company that I was a part of. It was called Vaco, and it was a, a like a financial recruiting and staffing company. And and that's kind of what I had done, um, you know, over the course of of my career was. Um, built this staffing company and it was great. It was super actually successful and I was making pretty good money. Um, but you know, I just, I I guess I grew up with nothing like, you know, not nothing. I had a loving family, great parents, but, but we didn't have any money and I never had anything, you know, like I, I always wondered what it was like, um, to have stuff and have money. And my family, we grew up in this little rural town. And then when, when I was in sixth grade, we moved to Bellevue, Washington, which is, you know, where Microsoft was born. It's this very affluent town. So I was like this, like, like little hillbilly kid moving to like this town where there's tons of money. So I always thought like, man, success for me, I'm going to have money. Like I'm going to go out and be successful. It was like this driving force. Cause my family didn't really have that. They didn't really value that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, uh, so anyway, that, uh, where was I going? That's with burning this? inside of you for all yeah. of these three years. You're working a job, you're making yeah. decent money, but you probably yeah. got that burning inside. Yeah. So I start. so I started this company with a couple friends, um, called Vaco and we were, we were making good money. Like we were the third fastest growing San Diego private company oh, one wow. year. We, we had like 120 employees. Oh, I was shit. playing golf three times a week. I got to a point where I was like, man, I'm making great money. Okay. I've kind of accomplished my goals, mm-hmm. but I just like knew that, again, there was just this thing inside of me. I was like, this is not what I want to be doing. You, you is- didn't get the meaning that you thought you would from the yeah, money. Exactly. I, I, I tied it all together. I'm like, I, this doesn't mean anything to me. This is not how I'm going to find fulfillment in my life. And, 
And, um, at about that time when I started having those questions, um, I, I started getting into yoga. I played sports all my whole life and beat up my body and Mm -hmm. a friend suggested I try yoga. So I got into yoga and, um, it was the first thing that was like actually restorative. And I started feeling a little bit better. I got a little more mobility through my back and my hips. And, um, that was when I really started to see this. I started putting the, the puzzle pieces together. I'm like, this is a huge marketplace. There's so many people like me who are active and maybe not competing in team sports anymore, but you know, we're going to yoga, we're going to uh, CrossFit, we're training, we're running and living these really kind of dynamic active lives. And I just felt like there wasn't a brand out there for us. And and so that was kind of the the time where I was like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to jump in with two feet. I'm, I'm going to bring Viore back and I'm going to go all in on this. And, um, you know, a lot of people thought I was, had literally lost my mind because I had this other business and this lifestyle that I had created and to walk away from comfort like that, to, to put it all on the line for an apparel business <laughs> is like, <laughs> You know, did you literally like sell your share? I'm out and I'm going to do this. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Who was, so who was giving you the most pushback? Were your partners just like, what the fuck are you doing, man? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think so. To a certain degree, they probably all questioned. I think a lot of them thought I was going to go leave and start another one on my own. Oh. Um, and I kept telling them, look, that's not what I'm going to do. Um, I'm going to go do this other thing. And people were like, you're really going to start an apparel business? Like, you know, kind of add them to your point. Like, it's like the failure rate on an apparel business is really high. It's a really, really hard business to be in mm-hmm. um, because there's just so many of them. Uh, but I just had to do it, you know? Like I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for those people that say like, when you're on your deathbed and you're looking back, you know, like I always believed that I'm like, that's going to be me. Like, I'm going to be that guy. That's like, I have to do this for myself. And if I fall on my face, I'll find a way to make money. Like that's never been a problem. Like I'm a hard worker and I believe in myself, but I like, I had to do this. I had to try. Do you still remember the the day when you made that decision? When like, like in what the first thing you, you did, what'd you do? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was like, kind of a scary, it's like almost like scary. You're like, start projecting like out, like, wow, like I'm going to, in a week, I'm not going to have an income. Like, <laughs> yeah. This is, that's real. This is, that, this is going to get real really fast. Um, but I had saved in a little nest egg, you know? So I had a little bit of money and I knew that I could afford to not take a salary for a couple of years. And, um, I was, you know, also like I never lived beyond my means. I, I'm not the type of person that made some money and went out and bought a big house and got the mortgage and got the big like bends in the driveway. That that just was never me. So my lifestyle never changed. I was still living in a one bedroom studio apartment, um, driving a car that I owned um, outright. And I just kept my overhead low. And it really, uh, it allowed me the flexibility to, to go out and take a risk like this. Mm-hmm. Now, being a guy who uh, can totally relate to your story of coming from a family, didn't have a lot of things. Um, I went through the same thing through my 27 to 30. I was, uh, w- I reached this financial point. Do you, do you remember that transition of like reaching that and, and going like, man, this isn't, and it, for me, this, it took a year. Like I got to that point, had the money, spent lots of it for a year and did all kinds of stuff. And then, and then had this kind of epiphany. I woke up and I remember I was in the worst shape of my life. Uh, my relationships were kind of poor, but yet I had the most money I'd ever had in my life, which is what was the driving force for so long. Do you remember that kind of pivotal moment for you? Like what kind of the, when the light bulb went off that it's like, Oh, it's not about the money. I need something else. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Um, I was actually, so I, I got married when I was young. Um, and I, got a divorce and I, I got into a new relationship that was awesome in some ways, but pretty toxic in others. And I was partying a lot and, um, I just wasn't feeling super great. And I just remember, so this is kind of a, a crazy story. I'm going to, you guys can choose to go down this path with me or we can just skip over it. No, but, no, let's um, go down it. But I was, I was, uh, I was at a 4th of July party, um, for this magazine, um, in Laguna beach and I'm sitting there and I'm, high out of my mind and I'm drinking and just partying with all my friends. What are you high on? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, you went here. Yeah. Sounds, yeah. sounds I, digging for dirt. Here. I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> good, good answer. Yeah, I'm just trying to one. paint the yeah, picture. That's, that's all. all. <laughs> Life, bro. And, uh, <laughs> this lady who had to have been in her mid fifties, um, comes up to me and she's like, can I talk to you for a sec? 
And I'm like, yeah. And she starts telling me all this stuff about my life. And she's like, huh? Yeah. She's just like, you know, you were raised in this family. Your parents were really like spiritual people. You didn't come from much, but you know, you, you, um, you have this business that you're working on with a partner. It has a philanthropic mission to it. Um, and then you have this other business that's making a lot of money. And I was just literally tripping out. Like, I'm, I'm like, who are, wait, I'm like, who are you? And, um, we start going down this path and, and she starts telling me, she's like, you, you're, you're going to do really, really big things in your life. And the business that you love right now, your passion project, she said, it's going to be very successful. And I was like, yes, <laughs> that's what I needed. That's what I needed to hear. And then she followed that up with, um, she's like, but it's not going to be with your current partner. She's like, you guys are, are not going to wor- be working together. Um, and she's like, you're also in a relationship right now. That's not good for you. And she's like, I don't know why I'm telling you this, but, um, she's like, I'm an intuitive and I work with a lot of different people, a lot of celebrities and, and just helping them kind of guide them in their lives. And, and I, it was the first time I'd ever really believed in that stuff. Cause like, I, I always was like, dude, you can, you're not going to sell me snake oil. You know, mm-hmm. like I'm not buying, I'm not a buyer, but she, the thing she knew, like how she was tuned in, I just like, couldn't deny it. I was like, what? And, um, it was that moment when I just said, you know what? I'm going to like, she, it was like, I knew it in my heart, but I just needed to hear it or mm-hmm. something from somebody else. And, um, it was right after that party that I was like, I'm going to fucking straighten out my life. I'm going to stop partying. I'm going to just take a year off and see what happens and get clear, you know, because if what this lady is telling me is true, like I need it. The one thing I need right now in my life is clarity. And so I started doing that. I started investing in clarity. I start, that was when I started really getting into yoga. I started meditating, um, I kind of stopped partying so that just, but because I was slowing down the partying, I was kind of shifting my social group a little bit. And, um, it was like a year later, like a year and a half later that, um, I met a guy named Chris Miller and Chris was kind of on the same path. He had gotten into yoga. He was one of the best skateboarders, one of the best pool skaters of all time. And, uh, he's like a celebrity within his own world, but he was looking at the kind of athletic space, Um, and he had started a number of brands, He started audio footwear. I don't know if you remember that brand, but Mm -hmm. it was really successful. And, um, Chris and I started talking and Chris kind of gave me the confidence to, to, to pursue this. And, um, but it was really that moment, Adam, to answer your question, it was like, it was, it was like having somebody who like saw it in me and, and it was like weird. Cause he like, you don't want to believe that you need somebody else to tell you that. Right. But for me, I just kind of needed that, that, that push. Yeah. And, and she kind of helped me have that confidence. And once the clarity came, it was like, I was like, you know, I don't know if you guys are drink, drink a lot or stuff. You know, I've kind of gone back. I, I like to have some beers here and there nowadays, but, um, taking a year off of booze was just like, it was like, I was elevating. Like I had an untapped energy source and I was, I was, Like I had a lot of energy aligned to go out and do something. Well, it's amazing how, you know, drugs and alcohol and a lot of those things blunt a lot of these, a lot of this stuff. A lot of times you're, you know, most would say that you're, we use these types of substances to, to bury something inside of us that we, we need to, to let out. And it sounds like you had this roaring fire inside of you and you were kind of blunting it with all these other things. And Mm. once you cut that off, it just came undone man. They, yeah. they can be indiscriminate tools you know you, you're trying to numb yourself and they're they effective at numbing but they numb everything including yeah. the good yeah did who is this woman did you ever talk to her again did you get yeah, her name some kind of oracle yeah yeah <laughs> she actually kind of became a life coach to me for for you know it was weird because I, I wasn't paying her and that's actually what she did for a living but she was like I, for whatever reason, am feeling compelled to help you. And I see it so clearly for you. I'm going to be in your corner. And so we started doing weekly phone calls and it was just like, it was just like little check-ins and she would just kind of keep me fired up and keep me going down this path. And, um, it really was inspiring to me. And so, yeah, we still keep in touch. That's so wild. As a matter of fact, I reached out to her, you know, every once in a while and in like, you know, when you're moving really fast, you're like, you have these moments where you slow down and you're like, wow. 
Yeah. Like this, it's happening. Like everything that that lady told me is happening. I just had that, that moment. So I reached out to her. I was like, man, I owe you so much. I was just like, I am so appreciative for you. You know, like you you changed my life and everything you said came true. I I just, I can't believe it. You know, that's Mm. so wild. It fucking gives me goosebumps. Yeah. That's crazy. No, that's Yeah, Can you ask her about us? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, do you, we did, can use a little did you did you feel like the the momentum and like the snowball effect? I mean, you meet Chris, you start talking to him. Like, what was what, what started? And then you're in a are you in a different relationship today than what you were at this time? Or yeah. at one point did yeah? We're, yeah. So at, at that time, I I I was in that relationship, um, and um, yeah, wasn't probably the healthiest relationship for me. And so um, I got out of it and. Um, it was hard, man. Those were some really lonely years, you know, cause I wasn't partying. So on Friday nights, like it had been so long since I didn't go out and find friends on a Friday night or I wasn't in a relationship, but it wasn't only booze that I took a year off. It was, it was girls too. So I, I wasn't dating no matter who came into my life, no matter how amazing they might have appeared. I was like, no girls, no booze. So that meant a lot of Friday nights, I was just twiddling my thumbs, you know, like looking for a sober buddy to like go catch a flick with or something. You know I mean? It's like, it was, it was not easy, but I just, I took those moments to just journal and just work on myself and, um, do things, do things that were healthy for me. Um, so, so yeah, um, they were, they were lonely times, but I, I didn't get into a relationship. And then once kind of Viore was underway, um, I met a woman who completely blew me away and, um, we're married now and we have, we have a kid together and I'm one more on the way. Mm, congrats. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it you know, I kind of look at it like, was I really the guy that would attract a woman like that back in the day? Mm-hmm. Like probably not. Mm-hmm. Like my wife today would probably look at that guy back then and be like, that guy's a douche. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel the same way about Katrina. Katrina and I joke about this all the time that if we met each other at 25, we would have just went right past each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> in no interest whatsoever. That's hilarious. So that period of time, were you did you start Viore at that point or were you like I'm gonna get clean clear and then did you start Viore after or was that all at the same time yeah so that was when I started getting into yoga and meditation and you know that has kind of led to like you know I don't practice yoga kind of the physical practice of yoga as much anymore but I do all of these incredible all these things that for me really help to keep me clear Mm -hmm. a lot of breath work I do a lot of like ice submersions I kind of got into the Wim Hof method for Mm -hmm. a bit Um, but I do things like I have a morning ritual that 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 just kind of helps keep me on this like path of clarity. And I feel like it's really important for me to keep investing in that because mm-hmm. as life and business get crazier and crazier with kids and, and a growing company, clarity is like the ultimate premium. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now you mentioned too, that at uh, your new facility, you have like an exercise and, and like, you know, workout equipment there and everything. What does that look like for your staff? And are, is this like morning ritual, something you've sort of, you know, put out there with your employees as well? It's not per se. Cause it's so unique to me. I think one of the things yoga is yoga is all about awareness, body awareness. Right. And I actually find that yoga is, is for a lot of people, uh, an unhealthy practice. Um, physically because you know for me like I started getting overly flexible and I I actually think that it it made some of my problems in my body worse Mm. because I wasn't doing it in perfect alignment and focus and I think yoga today is really a physical thing you're flowing through this class you're jamming music Mm -hmm. that you're not focused on alignment and, and proper body mechanics and um, so it wasn't until I, I met a guy named Mike Stromsness down in San Diego. He owns a gym called Neutrility and um, his Instagram's the Enlightened Savage, but he's a, he's a rad dude. And uh, he had been working with some professional surfers that I knew. And um, they were like, you should really go talk to Mike and he could help you with this kind of, I have an unstable um, sacrum and my, my back goes out really easily. And he just showed me some really simple things that I can do every day to kind of stabilize my pelvis. And so my morning ritual now is breath work. Um, I do some light exercises that like stabilize and build strength in my core, give me the mobility that I need. Um, for my specific type of injuries that I'm working through. And, um, then I get in the ice and I get out of the ice and I'm just ready to go every yeah. morning. Yeah. That's every great, morning man. you jump in ice. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How long? 
you know, it started with, you know, the ego was like, stay in here longer. (laughs) But uh, I found that for me, like a minute is the right amount of time. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I I mean, I I do. Yep. I do cold showers and it's it's more effective than coffee for me and it's it's cleaner oh, yeah. it's a much cleaner energy. Do you, yeah. do you know I don't know if you you guys even know this this was what originally connected us. So part of Taylor's job is to to seek out companies like you is to look for somebody uh, who he and he's and Taylor's incredibly talented when it comes to seeing a, a company on its rise and just knowing that it aligns with us and he brought uh, your website to me and he says hey check out this brand um, I think you're going to really dig it, what they're into. And that was the first thing that, I, that popped up, I think, on when I looked at Instagram, is the, the ice bucket, or the ice <laughs> yeah. bath down yeah. there. And it was right at the same time that we were actually having Wim Hof training coming on in here. Yep. And right away, that's what initially I said, okay, I'm interested. Like, I want to know, this guy's already on this. I already know he's probably done work into working inside and things like that. Like, his va- there's a good chance his values align with ours. Yeah. So that was really what what drew us. And I mean, you could have just been another because Taylor brings shit all the time in front of the, the desk and says, "Hey, check this company out. Check this company out. Check yeah. this company out." And I said, "Yeah, dude, let's let's make the connection. Let's see if there's something there." Um, yeah, and I don't know if that wasn't there. I don't know if we would have ever connected. <laughs> and it's it's wild to mm-hmm. sit here and listen to your entire story. But how much we're alike and how much we're, we mm-hmm. align is, is is amazing, and that's a big part of it. I think that you value uh, you value that. That's our, our, a lot of our our core values are very very similar to your guys's core values, which has made this uh, such an incredible uh, partnership. Now, what is uh, you did something too? I want to get into where you did the reverse of what you know, businesses or clothing lines would have done 20 plus years ago, which is the start brick and mortar. And then you potentially get into the online. You guys started online, but now you're starting to venture into the brick and mortar. Tell me a little bit about that process. Why do that? What's the strategy behind that and what that it's been like for you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, going back to, um, kind of the start of the business when, you know, we, I was taking those samples around to, you know, we call it wholesale, but those are kind of other brick and mortars. Think of like Nordstrom or REI. Those are like our wholesale accounts. But, you know, I was taking product around and people just didn't, they weren't interested. You know, we were too early to the category. It's funny because now they're all focused on it. Now active wear is a big part of everyone's business. Mm-hmm. I don't care if you're an outdoor shop or, you know, you're a fashion boutique, you've got some active wear in your store. But at the time, you know, it was a little bit before that. Um, so, so we had to figure things out, right? Like our business plan when we had originally launched was that wholesale would be a big part of it. And when we got out there, it was tough sledding. And then we realized that the accounts that did bring in the brand, you know, they didn't know how to merchandise it. They weren't focused on it. It was just, sl- it was pushed into the corner. And so we, we had to think on our feet, all right, like, how are we going to pivot this business and make this thing successful? And those were the days where I started getting really scared, you know, and wondering if we were actually going to make this thing go. And, um, through, you know, talking with some of um, my mentors, you know, we decided that with the money that we had left, we were kind of dwindling down to the wire and it was going to be hard to go out and get more money with what we have, what we had proven to date. We decided we're going to take all the rest of our money and we're going all in on digital marketing. We're going to, we're going to put this money into the Facebook engine and we're going to find out if people come to our site and if we've got something. Hmm. And we used kind of a yoga messaging because we we're like, there's a lot of guys into yoga. Um, they're an underserved market. And so we, we kind of used that as our entry point in our communication. It was like men's yoga clothing. And we quickly learned that we were on, like, it was like the first money in was like a dollar. So we'd put a dollar into Facebook, we'd get a dollar in sales. And so we were losing money. It was like giving product away pretty much. Mm-hmm. But we were like, okay, people are buying. Then like a couple months in, we put in a dollar, we get $2 back. Oh, now we're working. And I was like, okay, something's starting to happen here. We're getting some of those early adopters. They're buying a second pair. Mm -hmm. Um, And then before you know it, it was like we were putting a dollar and we were getting $3 back. And we were putting in more and more and more. And now, I mean, we're putting in a dollar and we're getting $5 back. And we're um, at at a very, very big scale. 
And so we were fortunate, you know, I, I, all this Facebook's in the news a lot, getting a lot of heat, but for me, I'm like, man, I'm really grateful for Facebook because it really helped us to build this business and helped introduce the brand to that niche community that was looking for stuff like this. I didn't have to rely on, you know, some buyer at Nordstrom or REI or Dick's or, you know, you name it, um, to tell me whether or not we had something, you know, we could go direct to the consumer and build that relationship with them. The other thing that really helped that, um, process was early on. We did a survey. We just reached out to all the people that had bought from us. We sent them a survey and we asked them, what do you guys, what do you guys like about the brand? What do you not like? Do you like the product? What do you use the product for? You know, what other brands do you wear? And what we learned was really formative in shaping the future of Viore. And that really was that, um, yoga was like, it was like not even the like second or third or fourth thing people were wearing the product for. It was like ahead of that was like walking your dog and like, mm-hmm. you know, sleeping. And then yoga was way down the list. And here we were marketing this brand as like a yoga brand. And wow. we were like, wait a minute. It sounds like what people are really appreciate about our brand is the versatility. Mm. Like they love the fact that it looks cool enough to just wear around town or go to a bar and meet a friend for a drink, but it works for its intended use. So they're running in it, they're training in it. Um, but they love the versatility and Mm -hmm. we were like, Whoa, okay. And so we started shifting our message to like, look, we're not going to tell you what it's for. Mm. Like, but these are things that you could use it for. This is what our customers love it for. And it was like run, train, hike, travel, surf. Like, and we just became, the story became about versatility, not specific end use. And it was like, boom, like it just started happening. Wow. So we start, we really relied, like our customers really helped inform us and we just, Mm. you know, we listen to them. That's that's awesome. Now that you have 60 employees, I think you said, what kind of a company are you creating for your employees? Like what are the, the values that you try to instill in them and what kind of an environment are you trying to create for them as they work for you? Yeah, I mean, I, I is the most important thing we do aside from make great product because like if you don't make great product, you don't have a business. But like assuming you've got that part right figured out, the most important important thing that you do is build a great culture yep. because your culture is your brand, you know, and they're, they're so synonymous with one another. If you have a really strong vision for something and it's authentic and you back that up with actions and you in, make investments in that, your, your team sees that and they, they build trust and trust is what builds great cultures. And so Justin, we didn't get back to answering your question, but you were talking about the fitness studio and this kind of thing that we built out in the office, but, um, it's all part of kind of what we call our investment in happiness. And it's one of our biggest values, but it extends beyond a product guarantee. We want our customers to be happy with the gear, but it's like, it's our commitment to investing in the happiness of our people, of our customers and everyone in the Viore ecosystem. And so we're doing lots of cool things. Like in the early days, we made a a choice um, instead of hiring more people to um, make sure we paid 100% of health insurance for all of our employees. We did that really early on. Um, that was important to us. Um, we brought in life coaches that have worked with our companies to help them better understand how to communicate through challenging situations with mm. their peers and the coworkers and how to set goals in their own personal lives. Um, we built out the yoga studio in our gym and we're curating... Um, you know, a whole curriculum of different trainers and yoga teachers and, you know, Pilates and people coming into our space to offer that to our employees. And, you know, we're just doing cool things. Like we we gave everybody a budget um, to go out and buy books. And we've got like this kind of Viore library where people can get access to knowledge and interesting things that they might share with other employees. And, um, you know, we paid for everybody to have unlimited access to a um, yoga studio um, down in, in our hometown. And so we're just, you know, we're just trying to find those opportunities to do cool things, um, with our people. And, you know, the more that we can make it feel like a tribe and, um, make people, you know, like really, really trust the leadership that, that we're, we're making investments and that we do care and that, you know, we're patient and that we're listening. Um, that's really important. Mm. You know, the people that we hire and the people that we bring into this, this community is, it's, it's really, really, really important because, you know, if you have leaders that don't have egos and are great facilitators and listeners, you'll be able to build a great culture. You bring in the wrong people and, um, 
and it, and it, you start getting people with power struggles. You start getting people kind of swimming in opposite directions and having different visions for the future of the company. And that's where you get in trouble. So yeah, agreed. Oh, yeah. Agreed. That's a big one. Speaking of the, of the future, looking ahead, first of all, the space has changed a lot in the few, t- few years you guys have been in business, right? This wasn't even a market. And now it seems like everybody's trying to get into this market. Looking ahead, what do you see in the future for this market and for you guys? Well, I think that as long as people are continuing to invest in their own health and well-being, I think Viore will have a place um, in the conversation. And that's that's really all we want is a seat at the table. And we want to be able to continue to bring our point of view to it. Um, we want to be able to, to lo- continue learning. I, I think that's one of the coolest things about being in the space is I get to sit down and talk to guys like you who are authorities in this world. And I get to learn from from you guys. And and that, that just lights me up. So as long as people are continuing to invest in this, um, in themselves and getting better and being active and healthy, um, you know, we, we see that the active, the clothing that, the, that people wear on this journey is going to continue to be important. And um, we're just excited to be able to continue to add value to that process. Oh, that's awesome. I think we yeah. feel the exact same way about yeah. po- That was always the goal when we first got into the podcast space is we just need to get in there as, as, a, as a fitness authority in that space and ride the wave. Like, is, we just want to yeah. be in the conversation. Just totally. want to be in that conversation as the space continues to grow. And we're both in that. We're both in a, a growing space and you've established yourself as that and you will probably always be in it, especially with the attitude you guys have and the culture that you're mm-hmm. building, man. Yeah. One of the, the, the most important things for us when we work with any partners, of course, the obvious, we have to like their product or you know what they're what they're serving or what they're doing we have to like that but we also have to align with uh, their culture um, the leaders in the company what they're trying to do overall what their why is um, and we joke around and say we have to like them um, but that's that's how we end up liking these people and we love your love your brand you guys do such a phenomenal job and we feel very aligned with you guys on all levels not just on the on this type of a partnership here? Absolutely. We feel the exact same way. It's been amazing working with the Mind Pump crew. You guys are all awesome human beings. Your mission is pure. We believe in it. And um, we're just stoked to be in partnership. Awesome, man. Thanks for coming on, brother. Great time. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.